Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today we are talking about three steps to bust through a B2B revenue ceiling. Um, essentially today we are working to address the issue that every business runs through where they hit a, a bump in the road where they just cannot continue to sustain growth. And specifically, uh, we're going to cover three the three steps needed to break through that that issue. Some housekeeping. Please do post your questions into the chat. You can do that whether you're coming in through a live streaming service or whether you're coming in through the Zoom call. Both of those work, and I will be monitoring those chats uh, in the appropriate platform. Uh, and I will get to those questions towards the end. A copy of these slides will be emailed to you. If you are coming in through the live stream, there will be an opportunity to sign up with a QR code at the end to get those slides. Otherwise, uh, if you're on the Zoom, that means that we have your email address and we'll get those to you automatically. A little bit about me. My name is Steve Robinson. I'm the founder and CEO here at Brilliant Metrics. Uh, in addition to my role of uh, running the organization here, I'm a public speaker, a trainer. I run workshops. I love teaching. This is my happy place. And uh, I'm excited to have you here today. Brilliant Metrics, we are a B2B strategic marketing agency. Um, really, the way the reason our clients come to us is we give them clarity. We help them get through all the FUD that is out there in the marketing space today. Certainly AI, privacy, uh, and other technology changes are not helping in that FUD. Um, but we make it all make sense. And we guide our clients and help them navigate those uh those rocky waters. Uh, looking at our agenda today, we're going to cover three things. First of all, why revenue stalls? This is the first step: is understanding the why and what the what the core causes are for revenue stalling out for most organizations. We'll talk about a positioning loop, which is the second step: nailing down that positioning, and then third, taking action on that new position. So, diving into why revenue stalls. A lot of organizations' revenue growth looks something like this. Initially, you get some traction, you get some momentum. A lot of that is coming off of the back of the founder or the team starting the company. Uh, and then uh, you hit some initial traction as you hit some product market fit. Once that uh, product market fit is hit, you can see the hockey stick start to jump up. And that comes from two places. One, success begets success as you start to understand where where your where your organization is growing and what's resonating with the market you continue to push and sell and market more of that but two you start a referral engine and word of mouth starts to kick in so even without any advertising or marketing support the growth of most organizations will look something like this in the beginning but what happens is that revenue that growth isn't sustainable it starts to cap out and it starts to cap out as you uh, hit a tipping point with referrals where referrals are no longer an accelerant. They're just uh, they just become part of the status quo in, in maintaining and 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 maintaining the existing number of customers and clients. Um, you hit a, a constraint on the number of relationships that your sales and your founder or your uh, leadership team can maintain in order to drive new business. And marketing really needs to come into play at this point. But most organizations, marketing just doesn't have that big of an impact. And this stall can run for years and years and years and years. So many of you who are at established companies are thinking you're talking like we're a startup. But this is this is common for companies that are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years old. They'll, they'll run uh, at a consistent run rate or pace for a long period of time without addressing some of the issues we'll talk about today. So why does revenue stall? It stalls because much of that growth was built on trusted relationships. It's built on trusted relationships with the founder early, and then later it's built on trusted relationships with the sales team. This is especially true the more complex the sale is. The more complex the sale, the more the trusted relationships are necessary to maintain growth. And what happens is people buy because they have faith, not so much in the company or the product or the service, but they buy because they have faith in the people behind the product or the service. And they trust that those people are going to come through for them, whether that's the sales team delivering on their promises 
or the founder or the CEO delivering on theirs. But the problem with this growth on relationships is that it tops out. One of the reasons it tops out is that each of those salespeople and that founder can only maintain so many relationships. Uh, there was a researcher named uh, Charles Dunbar. He coined the phrase Dunbar's number, uh, which he pegged the number of people that any one person can maintain a trusted relationship with to be around 150. So if you're not constantly adding salespeople, you can't add any more than 150 relationships at any one given time per salesperson. And yes, the sales team will drop out of some relationships and replace them with new ones, but that's limited and it will limit the growth of the organization. Certainly if you're in an organization that's largely founder-led sales, you're gonna hit this fairly quickly. Referrals have a similar limitation, but slightly different. So the way referrals work is you, you, you can create a beautiful upward spiral. You can create a feedback loop where as you add customers at the beginning, they uh, have a good experience. They refer new customers. Those customers get added. They have a good experience. They refer new customers. They get added. And then they have a good experience. They refer new customers. They get added. And they have a, new, they have a good experience. The challenge here is it's limited by the customer's trusted relationships. And depending on your industry, your customers just might not know that many other customers that uh, for you, they might not know that they might not be networking with other people just like them. They're networking with other folks in their industry. The other issues are the unpredictable timing of referrals. And we all see this if we've if we work in an organization that runs largely on referrals, those referrals come in chunks and, and buckets and, and, and there are peaks and valleys and they're just not consistent, which means that the sales team may not be able to take consistent action on all of those referrals all the time. Your customers don't always know what the best fit customers are for your organization and the people they refer may or may not be the right fit, which means they're not going to have that great experience and they're not going to refer more business. And so uh, a company can fall off from its core target audience pretty quickly if they're growing only through referrals. The other issue is this virtuous cycle can turn into a, uh, a downward spiral. If you stop adding new customers, you stop getting referrals. If you stop getting referrals, you stop adding new customers. If you stop adding new customers, you stop getting referrals. And so while referrals are beautiful things, they're hard to rely on as an engine for growth and they often cap out as your customers run out of best fit customers to refer. And that leads me to the final point. If you end up in this negative downward spiral, your referrals fall, fall, fall off just exactly when you need them most. And so it is really important to understand that referrals are a double-edged sword. They can drive you up, and they can drive you back down because the minute they stop working is when you absolutely need them the most. So an organization, when they hit this, this, this flattened growth curve, one of the first things that comes to mind is let's add marketing. If you have marketing already and advertising already, let's, let's pour more fuel on that and bust out of this, this, this flat line, this plateau that we've hit. The challenge with that is that it, it, it doesn't work. The, the founder, the owner thinks, okay, we can just continue the previous trajectory if we just get the marketing in place. But the reality is if you're selling on trusted relationships, adding more marketing does not make more trusted relationships. Marketing does not generate trusted relationships. Marketing increases awareness and trust for the organization, but not trusted relationships and people, which is how you got from where you were to where you are. To get from where you are to where you want to be, you can't just pour, pour marketing dollars on the problem. So what happens is you add marketing and you get a little bump initially because you're adding efficiency to those relationships. Certainly having trust and awareness of the organization will definitely make the sales team's job a whole lot easier and make more of those referrals come through. 
but it has limits. It's an incremental change. It's not going to put you back on that growth trajectory. To get back on that growth trajectory, you need to look at your positioning. I would say eight to ten, eight to nine times out of 10, this is the issue that is holding an organization back. They are able to grow on relationships because people have faith in the people that they're talking to, not in the product or service. If you nail the positioning, then your prospect will see your offer as a no brainer. They will have faith in the offer. They will have faith in the solution. They'll have faith in the product. They'll have faith in the service to be an effective panacea to their issue or to be an effective enabler of an opportunity. Just to give you an example in how powerful positioning can be, I want you to imagine for a moment, this is your dog. And maybe some of you actually have a golden like this and know exactly the challenges that come with hair or fur all over your house. If you have this dog and you have fur all over your house and you are presented with two vacuum cleaners at the store, one at $295 that is specifically engineered to deal with this hair problem that you're dealing with, and one that is $275 that is the Consumer Reports all-round best pick, which one are you going to pick? Well, it's a no-brainer to spend the extra 20 bucks to get the one that's going to solve exactly what my problem is. That, that vacuum that is marketed to people with dog hair problems is marketed to a subset of the marketplace, but it is the perfect solution. It is the no-brainer solution to that set of the market. To put it in other terms, let's go through some kitchen utensils here. So let's say you need to get the last out of a jar of peanut butter. Are you going to use the tool on the right or the tool on the left? Okay, now you need to remove a hard boiled egg from boiling water. Are you going to use the tool on the right or the tool on the left? How about cooking a hamburger? Tool on the right, tool on the left. See, the tool on the right is marketed as a fits all solution. They actually say you can use it for all of the things I just described, but if you had it in your drawer along with the tools on the left, it would never get touched because you'd grab the right tool for the job if the opportunity availed itself. This is no different from your prospects. And so another challenge that we see with organizations and positioning is they will attempt to be the fits all solution for every single person in their marketplace. And the challenge with that is that they end up being an okay solution for everyone in the market, but not the ideal solution for everyone in the market. And then they're falling back on relationships to close that gap. Because if the salesperson says, oh, we can cater to your exact needs, we understand this, that, or the other thing in those conversations, they can change the perception in the sales conversation that they are actually or can contort themselves into being the tool on the left, even though all of their marketing and advertising and website and collateral positions them as the tool on the right. So positioning is the art of becoming the obvious, the no-brainer solution for a subset of the market. That subset can be rather large. It doesn't have to be a tiny niche that you're going after, but you're never going to be everything to everyone. And as long as you're trying, you'll continue to hit a revenue ceiling because your focus or your growth is entirely dependent on the relationships at hand. So if marketing can't pour gasoline on a fire of relationships, what can it do? Well, it can absolutely pour gasoline on the fire of being the obvious value to a subset of the market. Because at that point, if you add marketing, all you need to do is inform more people in that subset of the marketplace about your position as the obvious solution. And growth will resume. So how do you find... Oh, I just want to add... This is not an or situation. This is not a, we are going to replace selling on relationships and replace that with selling on position. No, this is an and situation. 
if you market yourself and sell to a, uh, on, uh, on, on an obvious value to a subset of the market, you can add marketing to inform more people in that subset, but then the sales process will exist on that trusted relationship. Retention of customers and clients is based on that trusted relationship. And furthermore, if you get referrals that maybe they don't fit that perfect subset that you're going to market for, they'll come in through a trusted relationship and you don't have to give up that business. Your sales team is obviously good at selling on trusted relationships. They'll be able to take that deal and make it happen if it is right fit enough to allow in through the filter. So again, it is not an either or, trusted relationships or positioning. The and is the ultimate. That's gonna be more, far more powerful than either individually. Okay, how do you get to this position? How do you get to this obvious answer for a subset of the marketplace? Let me introduce a concept called the positioning loop. The positioning loop, spice, loop starts by identifying your best customers. Take a look through your, custo your, your, your past sales data, find the customers that are the stickiest and the most profitable. Because you don't want to lean in and grow into an unprofitable customer segment. So just because they're high revenue and they're sticky doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best place to try and grow into. You're looking for high profit and you're looking for low churn or high retention. Once you've identified those customers, now it's time to figure out what do they have in common? What characteristics do they share? How are their needs unique in the marketplace? Based on that, you can start to put together a picture of which of your differentiators make you the perfect solution for them. Why are they so sticky? Why do they continue to coming back, come back to you for services or products? Why would they not look at alternatives, both competitors and other ways of accomplishing the same goal, like hiring staff, spinning up a new department, going after a completely different technological solution or a way of solving the problem, right? Those are all alternatives they could be pursuing, but they're not, they're buying from you. Why are they choosing you over competitors? Off of that, you start to pull together a refined list of differentiators. I'm sure you have lists of differentiators around your products and services, but I'm asking you to take a hard look at them and start to simplify and limit them down to the ones that actually cause those customers to stick around. So once you have these differentiators, what could you add to be even, even more of an obvious solution to those ideal fit customers that you identified in step, step one? Are there other attributes to your product or your service or the customer service around your, your product? that you can add to become the obvious no-brainer solution to them. Sometimes those add-ons are at no cost, or maybe you're doing them, you're just not talking about them. Now we're gonna enter the loop because based on the differentiators you just documented in the prior step, now you can take a look and say, who would this be perfect for? Because chances are, there are customers outside of the ones that you looked at to come up with those differentiators that the same set of differentiators are absolutely perfect for as well. And so it's a matter of trying to take your differentiators, your unique attributes in the marketplace and match those up with the audience that would value them most. Clarify and now start to write up not just a list of customers, but actually the and, and, and characteristics of those customers, but the characteristics of the marketplace, the, 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 the subset of the marketplace that you can best serve. And then from there, just continue the loop. Refine the target audience. Off of the target audience, you're going to refine the differentiators that they're going to value most and make you the no-brainer solution. Off of the differentiators, you can expand or contract the target audience. Off of the target audience, you can expand or contract the differentiators and just go through this loop until you feel like you have an absolute no-brainer solution for a subset of the market. It's important to note that you need to do this for each product. And hopefully 
when you or at least product category, not for each individual product, but each product category that you operate in. Um, and hopefully when you get to the end of the exercise, there's a cohesive picture of differentiators across product categories or product lines that add up to a brand level set of differentiators. If not, you may have a brand, uh, a brand issue there where you need to take a hard look at, do these differentiators mean that we should really split off some of these products and focus on some sort of brand associated with those individual products rather than uh, a, a brand associated with the overall company? Uh, you see that, you know, like Hyundai is a great example of that. Uh, they recognized that the reason why people buy or bought Hyundai Genesis was not the same why they'd buy any other Hyundai. And so they have really pulled back on the Hyundai branding when they market Genesis cars and focused on the Genesis branding in order to uh, fix that misalignment. Okay. Taking it to market, step three. So we've identified the root cause. We've uh, adjusted our positioning. And now it's time to take this new positioning to market. So now let's add marketing. We have the position. If we inform more people in the subset, we can sell on uh, we can sell and retain on our trusted relationships because our sales team is good at that part. And we can resume growth. Here at Brilliant Metrics, we have six B2B initiative types or methodologies that we have refined over the years. I'm going to loop through them really quick, and then we'll focus on the three that actually fit this use case. So one is brand, simply raising brand awareness. This makes sense, perhaps, if your positioning ties up neat and tidily into a brand positioning and your sales team is able to close that revenue on their own. Maybe you could go here. Revenue is really, uh, these are your account-based marketing, account-based experiences, go-to-market, some people call it, but it's sales and marketing going in, going into uh, 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 accounts together. Here, certainly having this, uh, this positioning buttoned up will help. But what's, what's nice about revenue marketing is that because you're adapting all of that marketing material to the individual account or accounts that you're going after, um, it can actually cover up a lot of challenges with positioning. Where I, I, I think you can get the most lift out of a refined position is through demand generation and lead generation. And the distinction there is what are you measuring? If you're measuring revenue from any account overall, existing accounts, new accounts, et cetera, and that's your metric for success, demand generation is probably a better fit. But if you're being measured on the quantity and quality of leads, now you need to build a lead generation uh, uh, program. And that's that's got different moving parts inside of it. The last two, channel and performance, are related to positioning, but in different ways. If you have nailed a position, your channel's probably already aware of it, first of all. But you want to make sure that you want to make absolutely certain that everyone within the channel is aware of that position so that they can represent you out in the marketplace. So your dealers, your reps, your retailers, your uh, uh, independent consultants, the folks that are selling your products or your services, those folks need to understand exactly which subset of the marketplace you're perfect for and why so that they can get you the deals and the opportunities and the 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 the, the sales that are going to result in a high customer satisfaction, more referrals, and more growth. And then performance, this is the this is really for lower dollar figure, um, high volume, low, low dollar figure transactional type of businesses. Um, most of you haven't gotten where you are on relationships anyway, so this probably doesn't apply at all. So within here, revenue, lead gen, and demand gen are really the three that, that matter most. I'm going to talk through really quickly how to pick which one is right for you and to take your new position to market. If you don't have any outbound sales, go to demand gen because without outbound sales, you generate leads for nobody to follow up on. And so when I say no outbound sales, I mean, is your sales team made up of uh, uh I, I like to call them, you know, hunters or farmers are the two that are out there, but there's a third type of a, of a server. 
if your if your sales team is made out of farmers and they have their existing customers and they work their existing customers and that's and and grow those folks, but see a, a, a new customer to follow up with as a as a deviation or a pain, you want to go with demand gen. Um, if your uh, uh, if your sales team is made up of servers where they they will take a sales ready order in and gladly work that to get their commission. Um, but they're not going to aggressively follow up with somebody that's earlier in the buyer's journey. You want to go with demand gen. If your sales team is made up of hunters that are out prospecting and making magic happen for themselves, then at that point, a lead gen or a revenue makes sense. Do you have a culture of leads? If you have a culture of leads, um, then uh, lead gen is probably the way to go. Although a demand gen would make sense if you have those, again, server type salespeople where they want an absolute sales ready lead coming in the door. If sales and marketing are not collaborative, then you are stuck in, you know, then revenue marketing is still not a fit as well. And then finally, for any of these, you can add a channel marketing program to any of these initiatives if you have, if you're selling through a channel. And I will tell you, a channel is where you will see the biggest lift, especially if you've refined your positioning and you're able to inform that channel of that unique positioning. In those instances, we see huge lift. So these are the 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 four different uh, methodologies or initiatives that you can launch off of your new positioning to bring that to market. Revenue, you're going after a subset of the marketplace at a time. You're going into battle with sales. It's account-based marketing. It's very um, very limited in scope to the target accounts that you want to penetrate. Lead gen and demand gen are, are broad open, but you're you're measuring things differently, whether you're measuring, you know, whether do we do we win on revenue or do we win on leads? And then for any of these, if you also have a sales channel out there repping you, absolutely you want to get this new positioning in front of them. So to sum up, limitations in relationships is the number one reason why we see uh, B2B organizations stall out in their revenue. Adding more marketing budget or activity cannot fix this problem because you cannot scale relationships with marketing budget. It just does not work. You can add a little bit of grease to the skids, Certainly having more awareness for the brand and trust for the brand and awareness of the products will make selling on those relationships easier, but you will never add scale. The only way that you can add scale is to become the obvious solution to a subset of the marketplace. That's how you resume growth. And once you do that, you need to choose the proper way to activate based on the type of organization you have. The core ways to do that are with a revenue marketing program, a lead generation program, a demand generation program, and any of those three can be run in conjunction with a channel marketing program. And if you do that, you'll, you'll get out of this slump. You'll start to resume growth. With that, um, while you're thinking up any questions you might have, I want to encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn if you'd like to continue this conversation or turn it into a conversation because it's me talking at you right now, one-on-one, -on -one, please do scan the middle QR code and, and we can set up a time to chat. And then finally, the one on the right will get you the recording and slides. If you're coming in through the Zoom meeting, you do not need to scan that QR code. Okay, let me pop over to the... chat in the live stream here. Okay. I'm not seeing any chats or any questions over there and I don't see any via the meeting chat. So um, if you have further questions, please feel free to find me on LinkedIn and uh, send me a DM, or you can email me at steve.robinson at brilliantmetrics.com. And with that, I hope you have a wonderful day.